Hello, everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight, I'm continuing in the study of the book of John. Uh, I'm going to pick up uh, where I left off in chapter 6. I think it'll be verse 63. Uh, if you have not seen the previous studies on John, uh, they are uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning. I've said this before, but I think the Gospel of John is the single most important uh, book in the entire Bible. If I had to single one out, if I was tasked with the whole Bible will be destroyed, but you can save one book, pick one now. And I, I say, let's save John. So please go back and watch it from the beginning. Uh, uh, now let me just pick up where I left off. I'm a KJV firstist, so I'll read it first in the KJV, and then I'll probably look at it in the Amplified. So chapter 6, verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. So... I think this is relevant to everything that's happened uh, in the book of John. Oh. Hey, brother. Are you there? I thought I just gave you the okay. Hide from broadcast. No, I hid you. Show and broadcast. You should not be muted. There we go. There we go. Oh, okay. Very good. Hi. 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 Let's see you, see you <laughs> um, I just read one verse so far, so you've just only right here at the beginning. Uh, welcome. Um, we're in chapter 6 of John, verse 63. I was just about to say something about it, but I'll let me uh, read it and then see if you have something to say first here. Uh, I'll read it in the KJV. It says, It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Uh, first, while while you're getting ready, uh, let me just tell everybody, uh, this is uh, Brother Nephilim Free is his YouTube channel. Uh, his, his, he has another channel, Evan Phillips. So I'll call him Brother Evan. And... Um, I, I hope you will subscribe to his channel. He's uh, well versed in uh, all kinds of theology, but uh, particularly uh, he can be a great help if you are wondering about uh, defending the account of creation. Uh, if you want to just defend theism and, and uh, against atheists, uh, then please go to his channel, subscribe, and there's a wealth of information that will benefit you. All right, brother, uh, ch chapter 6, verse 63 in John, do you, uh, what do you say about mm -hmm. that? Um, I, I, I hadn't, you know, uh, really looked at it yet. Let me, let me read it myself. You just read, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are a spirit, they are life. Uh, well, I'm, it just seems to me that uh, he's, he's, he's telling us that, you know, the flesh is going to perish. It's, it's not what's important to God. You're not going to gain the eternal kingdom uh, from 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 the flesh. It's, it's the spirit of God that saves us. We need to know God in spirit. God says in His Word, uh, "Be still and know that I am God." It's not your flesh that's learning God. It's your spirit that's in touch with Him. So yeah, that's it's, it's all about the spirit in it. Well, uh, this verse here, I think, uh, is uh, very relevant to the entire study of John up to this point, starting in the very beginning, uh, we have uh, Jesus interacting with Nicodemus, and Nicodemus has no clue what Jesus is talking about, but Jesus is basically concluding that you're, you're a teacher in Israel, and yet don't, you don't understand spiritual things. He's, he's thinking literally that Jesus is saying you've got to go back into your mother's womb to be born again, and he's not looking at it through spiritual eyes. Right. The same thing happened with the Samaritan woman at the well. She was taking him literally instead of understanding his spiritual message. And now, uh, just before this verse in chapter 6, we have this great <laughs> um, 
falling away that's coming where uh, because Jesus is telling them that he is the bread from heaven and that his his body is is a real bread and and that, that they need to actually eat his flesh and drink his blood yeah. uh, these people and he says to them since they they're appalled by it uh, this is what we covered last time and then it was the very end of that study they were so appalled by what Jesus said and he and then he's answering them. he says it, it, you don't get it I'm speaking to you in a spiritual sense and you you uh, it's not meant to be taken literally that you literally have to eat his flesh right um, so now in this verse here I think that this is relevant to that everything that's happened and and we know that Jesus uh, spoke in parables and people asked him, well, why are you speaking in parables all the time? It's so confusing. People are not understanding you. And he purposely spoke in uh, where you, you had to have spiritual eyes and spiritual ears to hear. Uh, if you, if you didn't have your, if your mind and heart and spirit wasn't right to receive what he was saying, you wouldn't get it. And that's why he spoke in parables. And so, um, before before I go on, uh, anything else you want to add regarding that verse? No, that's excellent. That's exactly right. Uh, uh, in fact, wh who which apostle was it that asked him? Said, "Why do you why do you speak in parables?" And he said that very thing to him. He said, "Because they don't they don't understand." That's the reason. And that, you know, thinking about it, it, must have been a little confusing to the apostle. Wait a minute, because they don't understand? You're saying it in such a way they can't understand? I don't get that. But I bet he did later. You know. <laughs> Yeah, we, we haven't come to the part where he's asked about the parables. I know it's coming up, but uh, it's to me, I brought it up because it's the same um, situation. And mm -hmm. that is that people are taking him literally instead of spiritually. And, you know, much of the Bible, of course, uh, <laughs> the... The, the atheists and uh, the, the various factions of Christianity, they, they've tried to allegorize everything and that, that should be taken literally, like the creation account. But, but then there are times where uh, even Jesus says, I'm speaking to you in a spiritual way. Don't, don't take this to be literally eating my flesh and literally drinking my blood. Right. Uh, uh, so I don't remember what apostle if it even names the exact apostle that that asks him the question but um, the, one of the things that stood out to me is that uh, when he's asked why he says that because if um, if I speak plainly they'll understand and get saved <laughs> and I've always used to wonder well why, doesn't he want them to be saved doesn't he want them to understand and and he, he's saying that the, 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 in other words before someone is ready he wants them to their their heart and mind to be prepared and they they're they're they've got to have the right heart condition before uh before they're going to be able to understand this spiritual things he's teaching them and that heartfelt condition i believe is it's some people think it's it's contrition and it's sorrow over your sins and it's it's you know uh, uh that kind of thing but no i i think it's humility the 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 fact that we need to be humbled and understand that wait a second he's god i'm not i gotta you know humble myself and and also that uh, uh i need to be humble because I, he's teaching us that it's impossible for us to get to heaven through our religion uh, so uh, I, I i can never be perfect and satisfy god so that should humble a person and when they get humbled then they're ready to hear the message and then they're really to, willing to say i understand now i do need a savior and hear right. this here. couldn't agree more yeah uh let me read that i'm going to read that in the amplified just to see how it phrases at 63 in the amplified it says um, um it is the spirit who gives life the flesh con conveys no benefit it is of no account the words i have spoken to you are spirit and life providing eternal life all right, so there's nothing really new uh, in the way that they phrased it that we didn't already uh, conclude. I'll go to 64 in the uh, KJV. It says, but there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. Um, 
And, and he said, therefore, I say unto you that no man come unto me except it were given unto him of the father. Uh, now, 65, of course, is a could be a, 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 a problem verse that a Calvinist wants to uh, to throw in our face. We'll get to that next, but let's start with 64 first. What is your take on verse 64? Well, I, I don't know that I have any special thoughts about it. Uh, it just seems that uh, he, he knew uh, what, just what he says, you know, who would believe upon him and who would betray him. But uh, that doesn't mean that he uh, predestined anybody to believe or not believe, and you know uh, that he forced it upon them. He's just saying he knows, you know, he he knows all these things, and uh, and uh, so he knew who would listen and who wouldn't, and who would understand and who wouldn't. And I, I, he's just because he's God manifest in the flesh. That's just all I take from it. Um, yeah, and it is interesting that uh, there's a lot of times that, where he he knows something that uh, a person shouldn't know, like he he knows what people are thinking, but then there's other times where we find out that he 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 doesn't know, and so um, in, in in his incarnation and during his ministry, uh, the scripture says I forget how it's phrased, but I think it's in uh, uh, Philippians. Uh, it says he. Uh, he's the image of God, but he set aside something and it's to be man, to be a servant. Uh -huh. So some of the attributes of God he set aside, like uh, omnipotence. He couldn't do anything unless the Holy Spirit worked through him. He omniscience. He didn't answer every question. He like when is the end coming? He says only the Father knows, not not the, even the Son. Uh -huh. So so he didn't. So in that respect, in it, we see in this case, he knew that some people didn't believe. Some people might say, well, maybe he just perceived it just the way that we would perceive when we're talking to people and we're skeptical and think, uh, no, they don't really believe or, you know. But uh, I, I think this is, uh, he knew he knew because it was revealed to him. Uh, and, but then um, it's interesting that sometimes he doesn't know. Have you thought, given that much thought? Yeah, I, I think there's a there's a passage that says uh, that that uh, if he wished to, uh, that he could have called down uh, legions of angels to his assistance when he had been arrested and was convicted of, you know, to be a blasphemy to uh, when they were going to crucify him, and he could have called. I believe that was the occurrence, and so uh, you know, here he is the authority over the angelic realm. You know, and then there's the passage that says that the Godhead uh, existed in Jesus fully in, in, in bodily. So I don't see it as uh, that he is limited. I see it as God not fully expressed. That's what I see, because I would not in any way say that he was a limited version of God. He was indeed God fully because the scripture states so that the Godhead resided in him fully within his body. So. Um, the only way I can reckon it, reconcile it is that not that he's limited God, but that he's a God that's not expressing his full self because he's made himself man also. So I, I don't, you know, I've heard you would hear an atheist say, oh, so he's just a part God, right? Just a piece of God. No, he's fully God, just not fully expressing himself because he chose to take on a human nature as well. That's the way I take it. I wouldn't by no means say Jesus is limited. You know, that's what I'm getting at, really. Uh, some of the th these things are, um, uh, the, we might think that they're actually subtle distinctions that we're talking about. And that's one of the things I found very interesting uh, during this lengthy study on early church history, on the, the, the arguments in the early church, the councils, the creeds, uh, is that uh, they they were asking these same kinds of questions and they were divided how best to explain these things and and then they formed a consensus and the people who were left or right of it you know they were outside of or what they called orthodox and they were exiled or excommunicated uh, but the this that kind of a question is one of the things that was debated because certain people were bringing in questions about well how can he be 
God and man. And right. find that 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 creed, they, you had the, uh, um, the the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Revised Nicene Creed in Camp Constantinople, the Chalcedonian Creed. And the Chalcedonian Creed was the one that they first started really addressing the humanity, his humanity, because some people were arguing that well he couldn't be human. Mm -hmm. and, uh, others were saying, that, oh, he's only human. He's not truly eternal God. And so you had all these different factions and arguments and different nuances of how to explain these things. Mm -hmm. But there's a verse, I think it's in Philippians. Uh, I was just looking for it. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, While you're looking for that, let me mention that to, to, because of this, because he was uh, God in the flesh. Uh, the, the the Greeks they they struggled with this idea. How can God be a man? They don't. They didn't get that either. So they struggled with it too. In fact, you know, brother, I don't. I don't think anybody can truly fully understand it. No matter we we can uh, we we can find only I think semi satisfactory explanations for it, but because God is is infinite. Uh, well, I don't think humans can actually fully understand how Jesus Christ was fully God because scripture says he's fully God, but he's also man. And that doesn't fit really in our human logic. It just doesn't wash. How can he be both? But I, I just have to accept that it is true because he's demonstrated it to be true and because scripture states it's true. And the rest is just human inability to fully comprehend God. That's the best way I can come about it. Well, we have we have the limitation of our understanding of these things. We also have the limitation of our ability to express these things and communicate, uh, you know, these things. And as I said, that's if you read all these creeds, you can see that they get really intricate. Explain, trying to explain how the Father and the Son are both God and their relationship, and and Jesus is not only God but he has humanity and and uh, but when I was talking about the limitation I'll give you an obvious limitation uh, Jesus in his incarnation is um, a finite he's not occupying all space as in as a man he's occupying the space of where that body is so in that way he, he there is a limitation he's he's, he's not a now people can say well it, his that's the humanity of him that the, the the God nature of him is, is still infinite and uh, um, uh, omnipresent, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't I wouldn't argue against that. But yeah. uh, okay, let me move on to this uh, next verse here. Um, it said, um, uh, verse sixty five, and he said, therefore I say unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Now, can you see how? Uh, a Calvinist could use that verse to to argue for their their position. Absolutely. And and what would you say to them? Uh, I, I would say that uh, what it means by to be this would be my take. What it means to be given unto him would mean that uh, God already knows who will and will not respond to his calling, and he and and he has given to them that he knows will this uh this understanding that uh, uh of who he is and that they need him uh, i i don't think that i i don't think that god shares his holy spirit with with everybody just on the fly willy-nilly he doesn't go around the earth you know filling atheists with the holy spirit because he knows that a hard atheist, he knows their life. Doesn't scripture say that he knows the, the minute we're going to pass from this world? He knows the hairs on our head. How many? So he knows everything about our life from beginning to end. He knows when we'll die. And he knows what we're going to have in our heart the day we die, whether we're going to accept him or reject him. So I, the only way I can really reason this, and I might not be right about it, but it seems to me that it's just him saying that uh, he has given this ability to discern to them that he knows will 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 cling to it and stay fast to it. I might be wrong about that. What do you? What is your take on it? Well, I I always need to preface uh, any time I look at a what we I would call a problem text. Uh, I preface it. Uh, by the way, um, no matter what theological positions people hold, 
um, in, in anything, whether it's soteriology or Christology or or uh, predestination or any of these uh, great uh, subjects, um, whatever your position is, people can find supporting texts or what we call pr proof texts, a text that supports our position. And then we also come into people present what they would call their proof text or and for us that would be our problem text and we can get offer them proof text and that's their problem text uh so uh, but the thing is when be before we make conclusions in any doctrine i think one of the most basic important essential principles to apply in our studies and conclusions is that we um we should not give much weight to verses that are confusing and debated by people. Uh, we should give a lot of weight to those verses that are clear. So there's two factors. How many verses are there that support your position? And are they clearly stated? A versus, okay, if I, I could give someone 99 verses in the Gospel of John alone that say believing. And there's nothing else. It's not saying repenting, change your life, do this or do that, or get water baptized. It just says believe, and 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 then we could go to all the the the, uh, the epistles, particularly Paul's epistles, and we can present even more that say not only all that's required is believe, but don't dare add any other things to it. So we could give them all of these clear verses, and we can give them a hundred or two hundred of them that are clear, that state one thing explicitly that no mm -hmm. one should be confused over. Uh, but um, and then they can present us a verse like this verse here and uh, it could be a problem verse for us and a problem text that needs to be answered but eat, whether we have a good answer or not the, the, the this my decision is going to go with the volume of verses that support a position and the clarity of the verses so we have pertaining to this question of Calvinism and no one can come uh, to the Father, unless the uh, come to Jesus, except the Father house it. Let me see, read it again to get it exactly right. It says, um, um, He says, um, I say unto you that no one can come unto me except it were given unto him of the Father. Now, I can explain the verse, and you just explained the verse. People might not be satisfied with our explanation. We'll see. Uh, but, and yet, it's a verse that is, um, um, uh, there's a, going to be a lot of debate, different viewpoints, different ways of interpreting it. So those verses, I, I'm arguing that we should not come to conclusions and form our doctrines based on uh, uh, the small number of verses that everybody's arguing over, but rather the multitude of verses that are clear. Um, so let me read 65 in the Amplified. I don't think it really adds anything to it, but it says, and he was saying, this is the reason why I've told you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him, that is, unless he's able to do so by the Father. So in that way too, it might even uh, be used by a Calvinist even more so. But I look at this verse, and this is a companion verse expressing the same kind of thing when it says, no one come to the, can come to the Son unless the Father draw him. And we, we're not going to argue that that's not true. And, then, and yet, we go to another verse that Jesus spoke about him, himself. He says, he says, just as the serpent, uh, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so shall the Son be lifted up, um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, lifted up. And he was, it says he's referencing him being lifted up on the cross. Mm -hmm. Then he says, in that manner, I will draw all men to myself. Mm -hmm. So it says that you've got to be drawn. But then Jesus says, I will draw all men. Mm -hmm. Now, the Calvin, what's the Calvinist going to do with that one? See, right. we, we have this problem verse that we were going to try to explain. But they have to deal with the problem verse that says, Jesus will draw all men. Yeah. What they have to do is redefine the word all, don't they? Yes, they do. Okay, so that's how I would answer the verse, is that it, to me it's a companion verse. It's stating the same kind of thing that when Jesus said he, uh, uh, that uh, the, no one can come to him unless the Father draw him, and he says, but I will draw all men. Yeah. So I think that, I think that the, the, 
Jesus, the Father, the Holy Spirit, whatever, they are they are drawing all men at all times because it says God does not desire that any of us should perish. So I think he is drawing, trying to attract us all to Jesus. Is there somebody else here? Let me see who that is. Oh, it's Brother Neil. Uh, Brother Neil. Hey, Neil. Hey, Neil. I thought you went into retirement, brother. I did. Oh, okay. I'm using... Uh -huh. Kind of a figment of your imagination. On <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I'm glad you could join us. How much have you heard so far? Um, I was watching when you were talking about uh, John and the Earl. I forgot what you were saying though, but yeah. All right. Well, I'll right now, for like uh, five minutes. I'd like to comment on these passages, uh, brother. Yeah, go, go ahead, please. I, I, I think uh, I think what I said is is well supported by these passages, and, and exactly, and it's what you're saying too. Uh, consider what we're what we're seeing in these passages from 65 down to 71. What we know from 64. Okay, so Jesus is talking to a group of disciples. Some of them are, are left. By the way, so they, he says there's some, and he's talking to the group of them. He says some of you don't believe, and 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 and, and I know who's going to betray me. And, but did he call them? Did he draw them? All the, even so, he did, right? He's saying, come with me and learn, you know, and I'll get you, I'll teach you to be fishers of men. So all these, let's, I don't know how many were there, but let's imagine it's a couple of dozen, right? And and so here he's got, he's drawn them. He, they have the opportunity to believe. He does not. He's not holding it back from them. They're holding it back from themselves. And so, and then he goes on to say, "Therefore I said to you that no man come to me except the Father had had, uh, had given him." And then he says, "There are many disciples that went back and walked no more with him." So when they started hearing this, a lot of them said, "Ah, oh, forget it," and they walked off. They just left him. So uh, didn't Jesus know? who would and would not remain with him. And then it goes on further to say, Simon Peter answered him, said, Lord, um, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? So right here we see that, that Jesus uh, chose the twelve out of, but, but he, he, uh, he called all these other men to be apostles, knowing that most of them would walk away, and then, but but he then he says, "I chose you twelve. Why? Because he knew they, with the exception of Iscariot, would remain with him. So here we've got Jesus calling these people, uh, and allow, uh, giving them the offer, and knowing in advance that that all but the twelve would leave him." And and uh, and of course the Judas also would betray him, and so if that's being so, that's just the idea here is to me I see it as God knows who will and will not remain with Him true to Him to the end. He already knows that, and the Calvinist is going to interpret that as oh you see He predetermined that they would He predestined them. Well He may have for the apostles, but not for everyone. The Bible doesn't support that idea. So I, I see it as, uh, ex, uh, as proof, these texts, these lines, as extra proof that God knows in advance who will and will not come to him, but the offer is for all. Mm -hmm. Okay, amen. Um, uh, let me see. I'll go through these uh, verses here and read them. Well, you, you did cite a couple, but let me just continue reading them. It says, uh, verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Uh, now, this, of course, is the result of them being appalled by his uh, claim that that um, his his uh, body and blood was what was uh, the um, living uh, eternal life was in that, and they had to eat his flesh and blood to be uh, get eternal life. And they, of course, they didn't have spiritual eyes, so they took it literally and thought of him as a, this is cannibalism. They were appalled, and they left. Uh, then it says, um, then said Jesus unto the twelve, will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, <laughs> he's always the, like the first that wants to answer all the time, uh, Lord, 
to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, let me stop at verse 69 there and just see if you guys want to respond to that. I, I like your comment about uh, about uh, about Peter. P Peter was the guy that loved to hold. It. He's like the kid in the classroom, always me, teacher, me. You know, holding up his hand. You know, he he, he was that kind, wasn't he? He he wanted to be right up there, expressing that he had he was learning the truth, eager eager to show that he was on board. Uh, and so that's an interesting observation. Now, here's something I'd like to get your opinion on. I, I've said this, I think I've said this previously in this study on John already, but I, but since I, I could make the same point again, I, and you're here, I want to get your re response to this. Um, there's a point when Jesus, in the future, I think it'll be, we'll find it in the Gospel of John, I, I'm sure it may be in other of the Gospel accounts too, but Jesus sent his disciples off to preach, and when they returned, he, he asked, well, what are the people saying about me? Who are they saying that I am? And, and they said, well, they say you're this prophet or that prophet. Or, and, and he said, but, mm -hmm. but who do you say that I am? On my license plate on my car, I have uh, Luke uh, 9.21. Uh, and uh, that's that is that question. Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, "You are the Christ, the Son of the Living God." But the, Jesus's answer to him is that uh, you know you didn't get this any other way except that God revealed it to you. And th there's a real big deal made at that time about the rock. And, and that his church will be founded on this and the keys to heaven. And uh, we'll get to that point and go through it more carefully. But it's, it's a real big event. And in Roman Catholicism, they take that event mm -hmm. to support Peter being the first pope and their, their pope, papal succession principle. Uh, but what I pointed out, here's another example, but this has already happened uh, four or five times earlier, starting off right after John the Baptist called him the Son of God. Uh, Andrew uh, called him the Son of God. Uh, Peter had already called him the Son of God. Uh, so he's been referred to as the Son of God numerous times already in this Gospel account of John. And again, right here, G uh, Peter is calling him the Son of God. So my question is, why is it, when it, it's coming up in a future chapter, that that happens about Peter saying, "You are, who do you say that I am? And Peter answering, why is that such a big deal then when it's already been established by, you know, four or five other people have been made that, that statement about him? Right. Yeah. I, I just, uh, this, uh, the, it was revealed to you by the Father. I, I think that's, uh, that's very interesting and, you know, the Calvinist again will use that as a proof text, and uh, but I don't I don't see it that way. I believe I believe God reveals Himself, and people reject what what has been revealed to them. Absolutely. I seen a non I seen a non Calvinistic Hellfire preacher um, saying that you know you have to be of Jesus's flock, uh, and so you know when they when a lot of the People that try to rebuke him and say, "Well, uh, John 3:16," you know, they, they just scream, "John 3:16, John 3:16," and he's saying, "You have to be of Jesus' flock. You can't be, you know, what I'm saying, just running around, running your mouth about God and, and talking blasphemy all the time, with, you know, without, and you can't just expect John 3:16 to save you. You know, what I'm saying? <laughs> that's not what it's for." I think yeah, that that goes back when we're talking about John here. It talks about John in three sixteen also, yeah, in a way. Yeah, um, you guys must know who uh, Bill O'Reilly is on Fox News. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Okay, uh, he has a series of books, Killing Lincoln, Killing Kennedy, and then he did this one called Killing Jesus. And I've I've had sent him emails over the years, upset with him, because as he's describing Christianity and the Bible, he's a Roman Catholic, 
and he, he's, he, everything he says is all wrong. It's not biblical in any way. So, but finally, after he wrote that book, Killing Jesus, uh, he he's claimed in that book that he never uses, in the, and they turn it into a movie, he never references Jesus as the Son of God or the Christ uh, because he says that didn't happen until after the resurrection. Only after the resurrection was he referenced in that way. And, I mean, it, it's so obviously wrong. Oh, really? Well, you've got to remember that the Catholics, they also put, the Roman Catholics put uh, Mary and, and some of the apostles and saints on the same level as Jesus is. I mean, the one you're talking about. Yeah, I, uh, I made a video several years ago, and the title of the video is Bill O'Reilly is Biblically Ignorant. Absolutely, you're right. I was so fed up with his... I mean, if he wants to talk about politics and uh, other things, and you know, and, and the, about America and the world, you know, fine. He has he has a platform, but if he's going to talk about the Bible and Christianity, um, that's when I really get riled up when he's misrepresenting it, right. like his his view that creation is just a a, a fable and allegory. It's not literal and other things. So he's so that's why I made the video about him. But this is, this is just related to this point, is that over and over again, already we're only in chapter 6, and I can think just off the top of my head, like five or six times where various people called Jesus the Son of God. And, but I've always wondered, maybe you don't have, I don't have a conclusion. That's why I was asking if you had any thoughts on it. Why, since he's already been called the Son of God repeatedly, why is it, when they come back and he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the son of God, the, uh, the, the Christ, the son of the living God. Why such a big deal is made at that time when it's already been called that so many times before. Uh, but I don't know if you've ever given any thought, but if you don't have any ideas on that, I'll move on. No, I, I think you're right. I didn't know that about Bill O'Reilly. Um, that's good to know. He obviously is biblically ignorant. All we have to do is point to Isaiah, which says, A son is born, a uh, son shall be given, and his name shall be called Prince of Peace, the Almighty uh, Father, and all that. Uh, yeah, he, yeah, he's definitely ignorant of the Bible. But a lot of those talk show celebrity hosts are. I mean, even Stephen Colbert, I love Stephen Colbert, but he's still got you know, a couple things here and there. But I think he's just saying it because they're telling him to say it. That's what sells. You know, it's, you know it's, it's all controversy from there and out. But I wanted to say about the scripture we're going over, it also reminds me of Matthew 7.22. Uh, many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and, and cast out the devils? And, you know, Jesus said, you know, Jesus, uh, you know, after that, he says, no, well, you never knew me. Yeah. Well, that particular verse there is a favorite verse of Lordship Salvationists. They use it to argue that, see, some people are going to go before Jesus and, and they're going to be uh, deemed as unfit because they didn't work hard enough. They didn't do enough works. Um, whereas the verse clearly is stating that uh, the reason they're rejected by Jesus is not because their works, uh, they didn't do enough works, it's just that they were relying on their works. They were, That's exactly what I was going to say. Yep. Yeah, yeah their, that, that they thought that their works were going to save them. Yeah. yeah, their faith was in their works, and therefore he says, I never knew you. In other words, you didn't have faith in me. You're coming to me pleading your case based upon your works. So get out of here with those filthy rags is what he's telling them. Um, Kind of like Benny, Benny Hinn or something like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, I'll go on unless uh, anything else to say before I go to the next verse. Um, now, this is, it says, um, uh, verse 70, Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. I'm going to read this in Amplified to see how they phrase it in verse 70. Uh, it says, uh, Did I not choose you, the twelve disciples, and yet one of you is a devil? And they say, ally of Satan, is how what they've inserted in there. Um, so, 
Jesus, we're talking about his uh, the idea that uh, he uh, he is God, but he's also man. And how to explain that is uh, not necessarily. Oh. Hi, Sister Preet. Hey, how are you guys? Uh, I can't speak for them, but I'm I'm just uh, uh, so blessed. I, I'm fantastic. How are you doing? Good. Yeah, have you listened to the study so far? I didn't get a chance to listen to tonight's hangout. No, I just joined and I'm I've, I've just been really busy trying to get ready for a vacation that I'm going on. All right, well, very good. I'm glad you're here. Uh, we have Naf, uh, Brother Evan, and uh, we have uh, Brother Neo, and we're uh, we're in John chapter six. The last couple of verses we're on right now, seventy and seventy-one. And the okay. question the question is, um, Jesus is saying that he, he chose the twelve, and yet one of them is a devil, and he says he's speaking of Judas Iscariot, the one who should betray him. So just let me ask, I'll let you go sit first, Sister Preet. Uh, uh, just, do you have anything you'd like to say about those verses? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, you know, Calvinists use, the, you know, you've been chosen before the foundations of the earth and all that. See, when you come to Judas, Judas is a very special case, and Judas was chosen by Christ, and it says that he was chosen. And it's like, how do you square that with your theology, with your corrupt theology? Well, that's exactly what the Roman Catholic pulpit uh, commentary says, is that it's about us, not Judas. They try to replace Judas with us, in a way to say that we're the ones that are at fault for killing Christ, not Judas. Uh, I guess I don't know how to word it. So, so I've heard that before also. It's, there's some commentary here and there that gets a little twisted. You know, so you want to start reading it. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I strictly take the early church's view when it comes to being chosen. And I mean, certainly there is an election, but it's a corporate election. It, it's never been about individuals. It's never been understood that way. But there's these verses in the New, especially in the New Testament, is that's where election is uh, mentioned quite a bit. Not so much in the, in the Old Testament, yes, but not a lot of statements about it are made as explicitly as it is in the New Testament. And so you have these verses, I mean, they like to throw at you, like, you know, you're not my sheep and all that, but then, you know, was Judas one of his sheep? Yet he chose him. Yeah, well, I would say that uh, um, we all, I mean, you wouldn't be in this panel if we were Calvinists, because Calvinists are not allowed in my discussions. <laughs> but so we all agree, we all agree that man does have free will, and we understand this uh, predestination to just be uh, simply answered by foreknowledge. Foreknowledge is the answer to predestination. Yes, yeah, destined only in the sense that God knows the future, not that He's ordaining it and imposing it on everyone. Well, not only that, brother, but. The passages in Romans where, where uh, Paul speaks of those he predestinated, uh, those he he chose, he predestinated. It, it what the Calvinist omits. They love to read that passage, but forget some very critical words in it. What were they predestined to? To be conformed to the image of Christ, not to predestine to the to the eternal kingdom. What they were predestined for is that those who are saved will be predestined to be in the image of Christ before God. See, that's uh, what they love to omit. I do have to say that, you know, when I, I've read a lot of the historical context behind what was going on exactly in the Byzantine Empire when Paul was writing this, and honestly, vaguely in the back of his mind Paul could have been thinking about the future generation Christians but I honestly think his primary concern was the immediate Christians because what was going on in the Byzantine Empire then was 
massive, massive, excruciating persecution. And their spirits were really down. Like the Christians were just being martyred left and right. And, you know, before Christianity even began, that, you know, a lot of, it, it was a very somber sort of an a atmosphere for Chris, Christendom at the time. And I truly believe, studying the background of it, what Paul really had in mind when he was writing that is he had the immediate Christians at that time in history in mind to lift their spirits up. Because when you look into even the Greek, um, those whom he knew, foreknew, that, that doesn't necessarily mean, I mean, Th that's never been like the under that has been the understanding like for new as in before anything was created that understanding has evolved recently if you look at the historical time period the understanding that that passage has had is those whom he foreknew as in like Moses Abraham like those whom he knew before like their time period where Paul was then writing, he, it, he wasn't necessarily referring to those whom he foreknew before anything was created. He was referring to those saints in the Old Testament, those whom he knew prior, that he, you know, if God did that for those saints, would he not do the same for us? So it was almost as if Paul was writing to these Christians, trying to lift their spirits up and saying like, you know, take heart. D don't be discouraged. I know it's rough. Because it, it was a very hard time in history. Let's talk about the uh, part of this verse that you're uh, referencing uh, Judas. Uh, the, uh, the idea that um, he chose Judas, and yet I think everybody agrees that Judas was not saved. He was a disciple, but apparently not a believer. And then that's, there is a distinction between someone who is a, belie a believer and, I mean, for example, Jesus, you can be a, a disciple like Judas and not be a believer, and then you can be a believer like some people truly have faith, and yet they don't do much to follow and serve and do ministry and that kind of a thing. So, I do have a question about Judas. I, I would love to get you guys' thoughts on it. Like later on when you read, Judas seems remorseful about what he did because he even went back to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and you know tossed the silver in front of them and said that I've betrayed innocent blood. He re he came to that realization. Yeah, um, there's um, uh, so are are you thinking that uh, perhaps he at some point did believe before he died and and that therefore he it really did get saved. Uh, that, is that what you're thinking is a possibility? I, I do believe that is a possibility because why would he go back? And, you know, he, he's clearly admitting that he, he comes to the realization, not only that he comes to the realization, he takes action. He returns the silver that he received and he even acknowledges, you know, I have betrayed innocent blood. I know Judas ultimately, you know, ends up committing suicide, but suicide in the New Testament and the Old Testament is really not designated as an unpardonable sin, as, you know, the Catholics believe it's like a venial sin and whatnot, but it is a sin because in the Old Testament, God says he who loves death hates God. I believe it is a sin. Well, I think but, that he's... Um, um, I don't think it's it would be right for any person to conclude absolutely that uh, Judas did not get saved at some point. He apparently he wasn't saved at this point. He probably was he wasn't saved before during the betrayal. Maybe he did uh, um, get saved afterwards and and still committed suicide. You're right, and obviously that doesn't prove, uh, exclude him from salvation. Uh, but there. Are, that's the kind of thing that I don't think we can answer. There's not enough in the scriptures to give us a... Uh, make That's a, exactly a, what a, I'm a, saying, a, is like some Christians will, do, uh, you know, take a very dogmatic position like, oh, Judas wasn't saved, he went to hell, and this sort of... I really don't think that scripture makes that claim that he did. I, I don't yeah. think we know. I've heard people teach that because the, this verse says he is... Um, it says 
uh, he, I have chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil um, and then some people take it to mean the devil uh, and then it says also that the devil I think we're coming up to the point though where it says the devil actually comes and possesses possesses um, Judas at, at some point if I remember correctly and for that reason a lot of people think that he is uh, the devil and that he is also I don't know I've heard all kinds of theories on it that he also is the one who will be coming back as the Antichrist or the false prophet or something there's, there's tons of tons of theories on all that but I, I don't <laughs> think there's interesting to talk about but we can't really I think it's it's wrong to get dogmatic about something like that when the scriptures don't tell us enough I mean when it comes to Judas what my well my mindset has kind of you know changed over time at first that was the understanding that I was given as a you know new Christian that Judas was anyone who hangs on a tree is cursed and all that but you know Jesus Christ ha hanged on a uh, a wood which came from a tree that uh, that's also symbolic of that but uh, Judas is a very interesting case that uh, you know Jesus's death was indeed predestined I mean if anything God predestined was that Christ would be crucified that the lamb would be crucified before the foundations of the earth and if Judas was a part of that but then Judas later realized because I believe Judas's free will was intact he knew what he was doing how God works that out uh, between him predestining and then humans having the free will I think that's a mystery I don't think we'll know but I believe those two statements to be actually true that God predestined it and that people played their part in it freely not out of obligation or not out of manipulation or anything on God's part but uh, Jud uh, Judas I don't think uh, I can say either or whether he was saved at the end and he's in heaven or he's in hell I don't know I've um, um, I think that the, the, the I said it earlier and I, I don't know brother Evan you might uh, you referenced that uh, we're destined predestined to conform and to uh, I forgot how it's phrased but uh, I think that's talking about the the, the the resurrection and the glorification that's the, that's our destiny but the the thing, thing is, the the subject, or the the principle of foreknowledge, to me answers it all, and it's not complicated. It's a simple answer that explains what pre why it's predestined. It's just that God knows the future. However, in the Westminster Confession, they go into great detail to argue against what I just said. Mm -hmm. They explicitly say, "Don't say." that the answer to predestination is simply God has foreknowledge of it. Yeah. So it You is know a, why they say that, preacher, yeah. is the reason why they say that is it's more embedded in philosophy than it is the biblical sense because we know there's two biblical truths that God has foreknowledge, God predestines some events and some things and he also foreknows them. But the mechanism, to see this is getting into like you know God foreknows but then this is getting into the how part of it how exactly is it that he knows and that's what the Westminster Confession gets it wrong it wants to define the how part of God's foreknowledge and I don't think any human being can because we're not all knowing we can guesstimate but that's all we can do is guess well, it's, n yeah. it's not going to be definitive. Westminster Confession has an issue with God foreknowledge as defined by non-Calvinists as like, you know, God looks down the corridors of time. But how do you know that that's what it is? How do you even know? I, I think the thing, to me, the thing is that the Calvinists, um, they, they overemphasize the uh, sovereignty of God. And so they believe <clears throat> because God is yep. sovereign, uh, that if God foreknows a thing, it means that He determined beforehand that it must be so, and that's not that's not true. The Bible we don't see that in the Bible, and that that's refuted by many many passages. So they refuse to give up this idea that nothing can happen unless God dictated that it must happen, because God is sovereign. 
But their God is limited God. He's not capable of creating a world with people with free will, able to choose and do whatever they want to. They believe because God is sovereign, then anything that happens and everything that happens must be something that God forced to happen. And so, uh, they, uh, so they, they think that uh, if, if God knows a thing will take place, it has to be only because he dictated that it would. They're not capable of, of allowing for God the ability to know something in the future, but not having predetermined that it must take place. And you know how this gets them in a conundrum, Evan? How this gets them in a conundrum is because, see, there's a statement made in scriptures where God says, I am, I am the same yesterday, today, and always, which means God doesn't change. Now, if this is the view that they have of God, that, you know, God, so everything that happens in reality is because God, prior to all of reality existing, determined it, then you must conclude, because God has not changed since the beginning, he has always been that way, then Adam and Eve's fall was determined. Now, how do you lay a blame on a sinner for sinning if the sinner is a sinner because God determined it? Mm -hmm. That's true. That's one of the most... But that's what gets them in a conundrum. Is, And I've seen Matt Slick actually jumped into one of my hangouts. And um, one of the people that who was in my hangouts was Cody. I'd, I'd I don't know if you agree with Molinism, but Cody believes in, uh, you know, libertarian free will, and he was trying to make a case for Molinism. And Matt Slick was very quick to jump on all over him and call him a heretic and that he's, you know, talking about a, a heresy. But I just found that so funny because I'm like, and I'm asking him, I'm like, how do you, like, that's like saying, that's like God asking a guy who is a paraplegic from birth to stand up and walk. How does that even make sense? Not even I'm not even questioning that that's not fair. I'm just saying, how does that even make sense? Yeah. Why would God even ask something that's nonsense? Well, that's true. You know, God can't... Um, if he predestined people to sin, then, then he can't blame them for it. That's true. I wanted to point out this about Romans 11 no, uh, quickly. Um, uh, this is, uh, these are passages that Calvinists love to twist, but it refutes Calvinism. Romans 11. I say then, God hath, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite. Uh-oh, so now who is he talking about? He's talking about the Israelites, okay, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Okay, so who did he foreknew? The Israelites. And why? Because God had predetermined before the foundation of the world, what? That he would have a people unto himself, which would bring knowledge of himself and a savior into the world and scripture. So what, who, is, who is Paul writing that was predestined and foreknown? It was not the individual. He's, these, these chapters, Romans 9 through 11, is all about Israel. Election, about election history, I mean, history proves this. If you read the early church fathers and like countless other like Athanasians and stuff, election has always been understood as uh, Israel, the nation, and then the church is comprised of the Gentiles who were supposed to be engrafted. Not that they were predestined as an election uh, individually. Right. Let me let me, let me finish this one thing here before uh, because I, I only have a limited time for the hangout, so I, I want to make a uh, one la last question and then I want to be able to close it up. Uh, it's talking about Jesus. I mean, uh, I mean um, that uh, Judas would betray Jesus, and there we know that this is it is determined in the sense that. Uh, God knows the future. God knows that, that, that Judas would be the one to betray him. It's not that Jesus, Judas does not have free will and he doesn't have the ability to uh, decide whether he's going to betray him or not. It's just that God knows the future. And that's stated because we there is a prophecy in the Old Testament. I can't quote it off the top of my head. But it, it, there is a prediction that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Right. And so... Uh, th this it was written in the Old Testament that this would happen, and so therefore we know that uh, it's going to happen because if it's written, it will happen. 
Um, so I see that uh, that prophecy there as a picture of what we're talking about. It's foreknowledge. It's written in advance. It's foretelling the future, but not because God's making Judas do it, but because God knows the future. That's all. Um, let me ask you guys to say any uh, uh, last things you want to say about, because I got, I got to key limit this to about an hour, and then I want to uh, uh, do a short salvation invitation. You go ahead, uh, Evan. I'll let him go first now. Oh, I, I, I would just share this one thing for you. Um, I don't really want to talk about it much, but I just uh, um, believe me when I say right now I'm going through one of the, the greatest trials of my life. I, I don't want to get the details, but it's a very trying time for me, and uh, it's extremely hard for me. And I just want to point out that God is gracious because when I have felt completely exasperated and like I, I've just told him, God, I, I need help with this. I, I really can't bear it on my own. Uh, this is just, it's tormenting me and tearing me apart. And Help me, Lord. And I cried out to him, help me. And he's been good to me. And he has blessed me by sharing his Holy Spirit to me and just lifting all of it away. Just melts away. When he shares, his, he put his Holy Spirit to me and, and, and shared himself with me. My troubles just melted away. And the only reason that I don't feel troubled by what's going on in my life right now, that I'm able to just hang out and hang out right now and not worry about the, 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 the trial that I'm going through in life, it's because God has been sharing His Holy Spirit with me for hours now and because He is good. I just want to point out how good and kind God is. That, that His children, when they're suffering in their heart, they're, they're grieved terribly. God will, uh, he will lighten their burden, just like he says in his word, that, you know, pour your heart out to the Lord, and uh, he, will, he will give you peace. Those passages are profound. He will bring you peace, and that's what he's been doing for me. I just wanted to point out how kind God is. Amen. And uh, I just want to say, following up to what, Neff said, is, you know, I've been studying the background of the emergence of atheism in the Western world and how it's correlated with Christianity explicitly, the changes within Christian thought. And uh, the, the Enlightenment period was merely the spark of it. It really didn't start there. It really started with these new conceptions of God that came around, a God who is controlling, who doesn't care for his creation, who merely uses his creation as pawns in his little cosmic game. And that's not what God is like. And I would just like to say, God is exactly like Jesus Christ because Christ said if you've seen me you've seen the Father if you have me you have the Father and he said to Philip Philip have you been with me so long that you don't know the Father that Christ as the New Testament says is the very express image and the radiance and the glory of God God is like Jesus Christ he is not being vindictive. He's not controlling. He is not this dictator who's just using human beings, his creation, his precious creation. He desires all human beings to have a glorious relationship with him, to come home to him, because he created you. That, that's what God's heart is truly like. And this theology and these theological ideas that have crept into Christendom have really put a bad taste in people's mouth and I can sympathize why because it did to me too because as a former Calvinist that I had to really come back to the cross to realize that what God is like is like Christ that's it all right, thank you very much. I appreciate both of you participating. 
Um, but I'd, I'd like to end every broadcast with an invitation for you to receive the free gift of salvation. Uh, we could talk about you know, a hundred theological subjects and all the different books of the Bible, but if we neglect this one thing, which is uh, essentially important, then uh, it would be a failure. So if you're watching now and you've ever asked yourself the question, what do I, what do I need to do so I get to go to heaven? Um, I'll tell you that the, almost all the people in the world today, even among all the churches in America and around the world, and, and for that matter, all the people throughout all of history, almost all of them answer this question incorrectly. What do they have to do? They think that uh, if I live a good life, if I'm religious, if I practice a religion, and if I follow some religious rules, that when I die, God will judge me, and, and if I'm good enough, he'll accept me. This is called the merit system, and this is the oldest, most evil lie ever told. Uh, you need to you need to change your mind about that because the Bible says that's not God's way, that's man's way, that's a philosophy, and the reason it won't work is because the standard we would have to meet to to appeal to God on our personal merit, the standard would be perfection. You'd have to be able to go before God at the judgment and say, "Look, I'm perfect. I've not done one thing wrong my entire life," and if you're confident you can do that, then you can turn this video off right now. But if you're humble enough to say, I, I know I could never say to God, I'm, I'm, I've been perfect my whole life, then maybe you can understand your need for Jesus Christ. That, that, the Bible says that uh, God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God demonstrated how much he loved us by sending Jesus Christ eternal God Almighty manifest in the flesh as Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and he came down from heaven and became a man. He said the reason he did it was to give his life as a ransom. And a ransom is a payment made to set someone free. Jesus died on the cross and paid for all of our sins, and that way he set us free from condemnation. And he truly died on that cross, and he was buried. And on the third day, he was raised back to life bodily. He predicted he would do it. He promised he would do it. He said, I'll be raised back to life, destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up. And the reason the resurrection is so important is that that's the sign or the proof that Jesus gave us that his claims were true. He is God Almighty. He is the Savior. He is the sole source of life everlasting. And he truly was resurrected. He he walked, uh, after the resurrection, he walked for 40 days among 500 witnesses. They talked to him. They saw him. They, they ate with him. They touched him. And that resurrection is what gives me confidence that my faith in Jesus is justified. Now, Jesus, here's a picture of salvation that I'd like you to consider. The Bible says that... Uh, that we're saved by the grace of God through faith, and, and that not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So this picture illustrates that Jesus wants to take you to heaven, and salvation, the good news is salvation is a free gift from Jesus. So if you'll just understand that and reach to Jesus and say, I need you to be my Savior, I believe in you, I'm trusting you, then he indeed will take you up to heaven. And it's a promise from God. Therefore, it's guaranteed because God does not lie and he does not break his promises. He promises all everyone who puts their faith in him completely, and then they're, they're going to go to heaven. He says, no one can pluck you out of my hand. I will never leave you or forsake you. And that's why I wake up every morning and go to sleep every night with a smile on my face because I have this assurance, this guarantee of my salvation. So I hope right now you understand that you need to reject the idea of getting to heaven through your own efforts and rely on Jesus Christ for your salvation. And if you do that, you can be certain you're going to go to heaven. <laughs> I hope you put your faith in him now. If you do, make a comment on this video. And thanks again, Brother Evan and Sister Preet, for participating. I'm ending the live stream right now. And bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.